Hi there, this is Dr. Narada Tamarisa and Tara Torres, our nutritionist, and we're going to talk to you a little bit about celiac disease. Um, this is a topic that's actually near and dear to my heart because I diagnosed my nephew with celiac disease when he was seven years old. Um, and he's now 17 and doing really well. And, you know, at the time he was diagnosed, uh, there was a lot of anxiety within the family about how they were going to manage it. And um, I think it was really important that we um, educated uh, him and his parents about the, the fact that you can really control a lot of the disease process just by changing your diet. So this is uh, something that I think is um, really important and uh, we should all be very educated about it. And I think that uh, whether it's you know, for ourselves or for people we know, it's good to just be aware of it. Now this is Celiac Disease Awareness Month, so it's very appropriate timing for us to be talking about this topic. So we're excited to present this to you today. Yeah, so let me go ahead and share our slide. All right, so hopefully you can all see our screen here. Please let us know if you have any uh, uh, issues seeing what we're showing you here. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about what we hope to convey uh, today in our, in our webinar. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the prevalence and the importance of knowing about celiac disease, um, identifying some of the symptoms that may be related, um, so the clinical significance. So what does it mean to have celiac disease and how does it affect our body? Um, also want to talk to you a little bit about how we make a diagnosis and what our treatment plan is, because that's exciting <laughs> topic. So um, celiac disease is actually the most common hereditary autoimmune disorder that we see. And um, the statistics are actually quite impressive. You know, it affects about a 1% of the healthy average American population. So there are approximately 3 million Americans with celiac disease and Unfortunately, 97% of them may be undiagnosed until a much later time in their life. So it actually takes about six to 10 years on average to make a correct diagnosis. So these are often patients who have gone from doctor to doctor trying to figure out what's causing their symptoms. And um, as you can see, it takes, it takes a while sometimes for us to think about this as a possible diagnosis. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the longer it takes for us to make the diagnosis, the, uh, there, the more likely it is to see other symptoms that might be related to this. So other possible uh, associations may be infertility, bone loss, other neurological disorders, cancers, and other autoimmune conditions. Um, and we know that celiac disease in women uh, can be, it's, it's more commonly seen in women, but when it does occur in a male, it is more severe. So again, uh, very important to recognize this and to think about it when we're hearing a patient talk about their symptoms so that we can actually make a diagnosis soon. Um, this is just a graphic representation of uh, the prevalence and uh, the, the number of cases that go undiagnosed or maybe even misdiagnosed. So let's talk a little bit about the symptoms that we may see. And you know, the, the hardest thing here is that celiac disease can actually look like a lot of other things. And, and so it's a, a great mimicker of diseases. And um, so uh, sometimes, you know, there are certain populations that may have worse symptoms than others. And I'll talk more about that as I go through this, but uh, symptoms that we may see include growth retardation. And this was, this was what made me think about it in my nephew when he was seven years old because he just wasn't growing like my kids were growing. And so uh, when you start to see um, delayed growth patterns, uh, weight loss, iron deficiency, anemia, 
certain skin conditions, and the most classic skin condition associated with celiac is dermatitis or pediformis. So when we see that, we really need to be thinking about looking for celiac. Um, osteopenia. And osteopenia is such a common problem in women. And so, you know, sometimes we don't think, you know, is there an underlying disorder that's causing it or is it just the fact that the patient is genetically prone to osteopenia? So um, it's important when we see this to make sure that we look for potential celiac if other symptoms are present. Uh, dental defects can actually be seen with celiac uh, disorder. Infertility, and that's a really big uh, condition. And I think, you know, more recently, we've, it's come to the forefront that in an infertility case, we need to be looking for celiac as an underlying cause for it. Um, and in some countries, uh, they actually don't start the, the infertility workup until they've worked for some of the disease. Uh, brain fog, you know, that's a really common problem. And of course we see brain fog with a lot of other, you know, conditions, uh, but, but celiac is one of those things that we need to be thinking about. Uh, now, you know, as I said, sometimes the symptoms can vary depending on the race. And we know that uh, when it occurs in the Asian population, especially that the symptoms can really be more severe. And I've already told you that uh, in a male, it can actually be more severe as well. And as I alluded to on an earlier slide, when you delay the diagnosis, you really can see other autoimmune conditions come up as, as, um, as we go through this process. And uh, so type one diabetes, for example, is something that may be at an increased uh, likelihood of occurring as you delay the diagnosis. Of so, you know, why is this so important to, you know, can you just say, hey, you know, just stop eating gluten and everything's gonna be okay. And, and yeah, to some extent, of course, you know, that's, that's good. Uh, in most situations, but we do have to understand that there are also are increased risk of other comorbidities, other issues that can be existing uh, and more likely to occur in a celiac patient. And that includes a 33 times higher risk of intestinal cancers, uh, 11 times more risk of esophageal cancers, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma occurs nine times more likely in a celiac patient than the average population melanomas or skin cancers, you know, these are five times uh, higher risk. And then, you know, a thyroid cancer, a particular kind called papillary thyroid cancer, which can occur 23 times more often in a celiac patient. Now, you know, what is celiac disease? So we hear a lot of people say, oh, you know, I have celiac. And, and of course, you know, they're very, they're varying um, uh, a spectrum of of different conditions that can uh, be caused by gluten or gluten sensitivity or gluten intolerance. So does every patient who can't tolerate gluten have celiac disease? And the answer is no, because there's such a spectrum of this. So there's some people who just don't feel well when they eat gluten. And there's some people who actually have this uh, very uh, toxic reaction to celiac disease that causes intestinal damage. And it's really important to, it, because of the reasons I mentioned earlier to try to differentiate these things because we do want to know when, when it's truly celiac and, and we want to be able to think about all the other conditions that may be um, uh, associated. So when, when a person has celiac disease, what's happening there is that there's this protein called gluten, which is, is um, you know, part of our diet and in, uh, contained in certain foods. And when we ingest this protein, it actually causes destruction of the villi in the small intestine. And the villi are these absorptive glands that are in the, the small intestine. And this is what allows us to actually absorb the nutrients that we're eating. So, in, a, in an individual with celiac disease, this gluten molecule is resistant to the enzymes that are being produced in our intestines. And because the molecule can't be broken down completely, it starts to cause damage to the intestines. And so there's this toxic fragment um, that actually causes the intestinal damage, this amino acid fragment. And uh, eventually, it starts to destroy these absorptive glands in the intestines and it impairs our ability to digest and to absorb nutrients. Um, 
and, and what's happening here again is that the immune system is mounting a, a reaction to this protein fragment and uh, creating this ability for us to, to really kind of create inflammation and, and attack our own intestinal cells and destroy the ability for us to, to be able to absorb. So in essence, celiac disease is an abnormal reaction to food because the immune system is creating this heightened um, sort of uh, reactivity and uh, creating a destruction of the bone. So here's a, a diagram that shows us on, on, the, um, on the normal side, of course, is the, these finger-like projections, which we call villi. And then on the right is what happens in the celiac patient where the villi are actually being destroyed uh, by these proteins. Now, you know, who, who should we test? And oftentimes I have patients that I diagnose with celiac and they ask me, well, should I test my kid? Should I test my uh, you know, siblings? And um, so here are some statistics that may help us decide when testing is appropriate. So we do know that you know, when we're looking at certain tests, uh, you have to have certain immune uh, cells that we can be, we can detect in the blood testing, and these are called antibodies. And we know that, you know, somewhere around the age of two or three is when we start to develop these antibodies. So when we test earlier than that, we're likely not to be able to make a diagnosis based on antibody testing. Um, so those uh, children over the age of three who may be exhibiting symptoms or those who sh might benefit from testing. Um, we also know that the statistics show that first degree relatives of celiac patients have uh, a, a higher risk compared to the general population and that risk is one in 10 as opposed to one in 100. Um, we also know that autoimmune conditions can coexist with each other. So anyone who has another autoimmune condition, such as type 1 diabetes, thyroid disorders, or autoimmune liver conditions, these are patients who may also have celiac disease coexisting. So this would be uh, beneficial to think about as we're seeing these patients and uh, testing for celiac. So what are the tests that are available to us? So we have actually a few different ways of making a diagnosis. And most commonly we may use blood testing as a screening tool to look for celiac when we suspect it because they have certain symptoms that may make us think about it. So antibody testing, this is looking for, this is a blood test that looks for the antibodies or the, the, sub, the, the um, immune reaction to certain molecules that may enter our system. This is the immune reaction that's occurring. And in order for antibody testing to be useful to us, the individual has to be exposed to gluten. So in order for these tests to be reliable, this can't be somebody who's already quit eating gluten in their diet and then we're trying to look for these antibodies because we're not going to see them in that situation. So this is somebody who's continuing to have gluten exposure and then we're looking for the antibody response. So this is where the antibody testing may be useful to us. Now, antibody testing is not perfect, so it's not you know, likely to show up positive in every case that we suspect with celiac and, and if they actually have it, you know, the antibody testing unfortunately can be negative. And so we need to have other methods of trying to either um, uh, confirm the, 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 the diagnosis or, or negate the diagnosis. So um, in a patient where we suspect celiac and the antibody testing is negative, or in a patient who may have stopped eating gluten for a while and we're looking to make a diagnosis, we do have genetic testing available to us. So the genetic testing is something that always stays positive. So if the patient is at risk for developing celiac disease, we may see genetic mutations uh, in uh, specifically HLA DQ2 or DQ8, these are different alleles. Um, and the presence of the gene, that means if the gene is present, the mutation is present, that individual has a three time, a 3% three greater risk compared to 1% for the general population. So once again, the genetic testing is useful in a couple of situations. One where the patient has already stopped eating gluten, and we certainly don't want to make them eat it just so we can make a diagnosis because they often feel terrible when they eat 
gluten. And so this is our backup way of, of trying to understand if, gluten, if um, celiac is an issue. Uh, or in that individual where we strongly suspect it, but the antibody testing isn't showing it, so then we want to do the genetic testing. Now, the gold standard test for celiac is actually a biopsy of the small bowel. So this is where we actually do a, a procedure called upper endoscopy, where we put the camera through the mouth into the, into the stomach and into the small intestine, which is where the villi are located. And then we can take a biopsy from that area and look at the tissue under the microscope to look for certain features. The uh, most common feature is gonna be loss of villi, which is where we showed you that the, the intestinal uh, cells get damaged and look flat. And then there's another finding which is very characteristic and that is lymphocytes in the epithelium, which means in that, in that top layer of the intestines, we see these white blood cells called lymphocytes and that is a very common feature for Now, you know, we talked a lot about making a diagnosis and, and you know, the treatment is really what's most exciting because it's such a, a, a simple treatment and it's all managed by diet. And so this is one situation where you're not gonna find us giving you a lot of prescriptions, you know, you can, you can do this on your own. You just have to know what you have to do. And so the, the management of this is really a lifelong adherence to a gluten-free diet and it's, it's almost that simple. I know that, you know, when we make the diagnosis and tell somebody that they have to go gluten-free, it's like it's the end of the world. Oh my gosh, what am I going to eat? What's left? Um, and, um, you know, I, I think once they, once we educate them and make them aware of all the things that are gluten-free, you know, the, the whole world opens up and, and it's really, um, not as difficult to manage as, as you may, it may seem at the onset. So it does take some time and it takes some, um, you know, reorganization of thoughts and a, a different mindset. Uh, but, but it's really, you know, for us, it's so fulfilling to see somebody who really can just get better with just a simple dietary adjustment. So, you know, here in our practice, we have the, the, the pleasure of having somebody like Tara who really can give our patients a lot of nutritional guidance and Tara herself eats gluten-free and, mm -hmm. and I, um, you know, I, I try my best to stay as gluten-free as possible, not because I have celiac, but because I just feel better when I really eat it. But, um, so we've, we've been through it and we have a lot of good resources for our patients and, and, and we know that we can support them through this uh, change that needs to happen. Um, we also have some, uh, we're going to let you know about some support groups that are available and some resources that are available for those who are really searching for help. Um, sometimes it is uh, difficult to make that adjustment in our, in our mindset because we're so used to eating a certain way and, you know, making this change can really be psychologically um, um, difficult. And, um, you know, there's so much of eating that is pleasurable and, and really, you know, gives comfort. And so sometimes, you know, giving up some of these foods is very challenging. So the use of a psychologist can be helpful. Um, and it's hard sometimes to make these adjustments when you're cooking for your household, right? So you're cooking for kids and you're cooking for uh, potentially a spouse who doesn't have to eat this way, but it's hard to make five different meals for people. Well, you've got to be able to kind of get everybody on board. So this is where, again, it, it may be helpful to have some support. And so I would encourage that when we're talking about making these dietary changes, that we have your spouse come in and, and, and inform them of why we're making these changes. Why is it so helpful for all of us to be doing what we're doing? And, um, you know, having the support of your spouse is really important. I do hear sometimes from patients that their spouse says, well, I don't want to eat that. I want to eat something else. And uh, maybe if they sat with us during these these nutritional discussions, you know, it would make it would change their perspective on why we're making this change and how beneficial it can be for, for that particular individual. Um, and you know, once we make a diagnosis, it is something that we like we have we need to follow. We need some follow-up care and, and testing to make sure that we are as gluten-free as possible. So we have ways of making sure that we're adherent.
Thank you. I think this is where I will jump in and start talking about nutrition. So not only am I a nutritionist, but I also personally have celiac disease. And like Dr. T said, I am gluten free. I was diagnosed back in 2012, I think. And I remember uh, the feeling of being very isolated and struggling with the lifestyle change that it was. And I remember going on an all lettuce diet and um, starving because I didn't know what to eat. And so if it wasn't for the support group that I found at a Whole Foods in my local community, I don't know how I would have survived. Um, so after years of just practice and research and educating myself, um, I'd love to share some of my tips if I can prevent even one person from struggling. So celiac disease is very serious. Um, it takes a lot of diligence and it takes a lot of consistency. And even with you doing everything to be gluten-free, accidents happen. Whether it's you eating at a restaurant and the waiter just messes up or um, maybe some cross-contamination in your own kitchen, there are a few tips and tricks that I wanna go over with you. So um, we wanna be careful to remove uh, any and all gluten from your diet. By doing this, we can reverse the damage that is caused by celiac disease, as Dr. T mentioned. Um, those villi will have a chance to kind of regrow and do what they were meant to do. You'll feel better, but just know that if you ever get cross-contaminated or if you cheat on your diet, this isn't like any other diet plan, you know, for somebody who's trying to lose weight and they have a cheat meal every weekend. This is a lifelong, everyday commitment. Um, and sometimes you may not feel sick right away after having some exposure. It depends on the level of exposure. And sometimes it's more of a buildup of, you know, hey, I got some, somehow some crumbs got sprinkled in my meal over the week. And by the, the end of the week, you feel like garbage, you feel sick. So here are some things to look for. So People who follow a gluten-free diet should avoid foods that contain, yes, wheat, but it also comes in different names such as barley, rye, spelt, trick to kill products, and these are found in a lot of your processed foods like breads, pasta, cereals, etc. So foods that are okay and commonly mistaken for having gluten um, but are actually okay are your rice, your corn, your oats, quinoa, buckwheat, and millet. Now it's important to understand that with um, labeling that sometimes people will slap a gluten-free label on there, mm -hmm. um, even though items like this don't actually have gluten. With that being said, I do want to point out the oats. There are some cross-contamination with oats just because a lot of the farms are grown, growing oats right next to wheat. So that is the one um, uh, exception that I would make in making sure that you're buying a truly certified gluten-free product there. Um, so gluten sometimes appears in foods or places you wouldn't expect. So it's used as a thickening agent in a lot of gravies and sauces. So you'll want to check your condiments. Um, it's sometimes used in medicine. So this is something you'll want to double check with your doctor or your pharmacist and just make sure that they are aware. And also double check your over-the-counter vitamins and supplements. You also can find it in things that you use topically, like your lip balm, lipstick, shampoo, conditioner, lotions, etc. So you'll want to screen all of these. And I have different apps later on in this slide that will help you with that. So celiac disease and gluten sensitivity in itself have become more well known. Um, gluten free eating has become more mainstream because people, even like Dr. T, she doesn't have celiac, but she says she just feels better. Um, we know that gluten or wheat is one of the top inflammatory foods next to dairy. So that's a very common um, description. Uh, many more restaurants are offering gluten-free options and training their staff about it. So that's great. Uh, a lot of grocery stores are just uh, stocking more gluten-free products for us. So that means more options, more variety, um, and plenty of gluten-free things to be found. Yeah. And I think, you know, like you said, Tara, the, um, the, the amount of gluten in the wheat can make you feel bad, you know, immediately or even afterwards. Uh, so it's definitely dose dependent. And, and I'm often asked, you know, how much gluten can I have? Is it, is it a little, can I have a little bit or can I, you know, and, and the answer, the right answer is none and, and as close to none as you can, because you know, if you aim to have zero, you might have a little bit, but if you aim to have a little bit, you might have a lot. So let's, um, make sure that that it's as you know as zero as possible as close to zero as possible so um the other thing is that this is a delayed hypersensitivity reaction so 
it is not something that oftentimes will affect you immediately unless you just overeat it. Uh, so this is a reaction that's occurring over time. So I have patients who say, well, you know, it doesn't bother me when I eat it, but it probably bothers you two days or three days later. Mm -hmm. So this is damage that's occurring over a period of time. And that's why the diagnosis takes time. And that's why we don't make a diagnosis right away because it's not something where you eat it and you feel it immediately. It's something that builds up in your system and creates this damage. So that's why the, the diagnosis gets dragged out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so living with celiac. So I think because of that delayed hypersensitivity, it also makes it that much more challenging for our patients to stick to it because if they're not getting that immediate reaction, they they don't understand the severity of it until later on when it hits them. So, um, and I also just wanna say, you know, it can be hard to learn at first. You know, when I was diagnosed, I struggled with it a lot, but practice, practice, practice. Um, the more support you have from your friends and your family and teaching them how to avoid gluten when they're cooking for you, um, the more success you'll have. Learn how to read ingredient labels. And like I said, gluten and wheat come in all these different um, names and terms. So it's important to understand what all of those are so that you can be hypervigilant and uh, spot those on the ingredient labels. Um, you wanna be careful when you eat out. You wanna have that conversation with your waiter or your waitress every single time. Mm -hmm. Even though for me, I hate causing a scene and I hate just having that conversation and having, you know, in a group of friends, mm -hmm. having the waiter come over, it's absolutely necessary for your health and your well-being. And, you know, some some restaurants will even come out with a manager just to double check your order. So become familiar with those restaurants and let them be your favorite because they're the ones that are looking out for you. Um, you'll have to learn some new recipes. You'll have to learn to buy new gluten-free products. If you're looking for help, I'm going to go ahead on the next slide, I think it is, and show you some different apps and resources that are available. There are lots of books, there's lots of recipe cookbooks, there's websites, there's Facebook support groups, there are nutritionists like myself who can help you um, learn this new lifestyle. Your doctors know lots about nutrition and they can help you as well. So these are, I'll post this um, celiac disease symptoms checklist uh, when we post this video. I think it's a great tool if you suspect that you have celiac or a gluten or wheat sensitivity um, and probably the first step in getting help. So um, on the bottom here are a couple apps. The Fujicate and the Shopwell apps are two apps that you can use when you're at the grocery store to scan your barcodes or maybe you're at home and you're trying to plan your meals for the week and you wanna look up a food, you can search it by name. But both of them work the same way, but different. One, I think, grades it on a number and the other one color codes it. So depending on which you prefer, I would advise you to try both of them and see which one you prefer, but they'll basically pull up the nutrition label and they will put in bold the words that are gluten or wheat, and then they'll even grade them. So a lot of times food, and I'll give an example, modified cornstarch, is not gluten, but it, it can be derived from wheat. Mm -hmm. So depending on the brand and the manufacturing policies, you know, these, um, these apps will point out modified cornstarch and then they'll give you a grade of like, hey, yellow, this might, this is a questionable ingredient, or if it's wheat or gluten, they'll put it in red and they'll say, stay away. And if it's green, it means that it had no questionable ingredients in it and it's gluten free. Um, the other two on the other side are Healthy Out and Find Me Gluten Free. These are two apps where you can use um, them to find restaurants around you. So basically you sign in, you create an account, you put in your dietary preferences, whether it's gluten free, it can be used for other allergies as well, egg, dairy, whatever. Um, or maybe you have like a paleo preference, those types of things. But you can um, put in your preferences and it will put up uh, around you uh, within a certain radius where you can find the food that you're looking for. And then also, I know the Find Me Gluten Free puts reviews. So other people who are gluten free or celiac are letting you know, hey, I went to this restaurant and I got sick. And you know that if there's five reviews really got sick, you probably don't want to eat there. Um, so just some helpful apps for you. Wow, I think that's, that's wonderful that there are these resources out mm -hmm. there. And um, I can't tell you the number of patients that have come up and said, you know, felt like they can't go out and they can't enjoy, you know, time outside socially with friends or family. And so these are really nice to, to have available. Thank you.
Yeah. So here's some helpful resources if you want to learn more. Um, we have the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Disease, and they have like a, a link for celiac because like Dr. T said, um, a lot of these autoimmune diseases come in pairs. Um, you also have the U.S. National Library of Medicine, uh, celiacdisease.org. Uh, We've got a local Houston celiac support group, and there isn't one in Katy, but maybe that's something we need to talk about in the future. Yeah. Um, but they would definitely have a lot of resources for you. Again, they're on Facebook as well, so you can reach out to people in your community online. Um, we also wanted to put the link for Harvest Hills Ranch. We work very closely with the owner of this ranch, it's Dr. Arland Hill, and um, he has a ranch, and a lot of his products are certified gluten-free. Maybe we can talk a little bit about his yeah. stuff. So uh, Dr. Hill's a chiropractor, and he's been uh, a great resource for us and our patients um, to get the very best uh, recommendations on supplements and food. And I know how passionate he is about uh, being gluten free, and so he's been again a great resource. So we're happy to support him in his venture to um, provide you know healthy food to, to patients and to, our, to to the community. Actually, and he comes out to Katie and does uh, deliver his products here. So yeah, good source for organic, uh, non-GMO, all all types of good things. So. Um, if you have any questions, you can follow us on Facebook. It's uh, facebook.com slash Katie Integrative Gastro. We're also on Instagram, Katie Integrative Gastro. Um, so look for more videos, lots of tips and things. We've been sharing all month about celiac disease awareness. Um, you can contact us if you're interested in scheduling an appointment with Dr. T. If you have any questions about celiac or food sensitivities, allergies, those types of things, or if you need help navigating a new diet. Um, I have plenty of personal tales to share with you and tips and tricks um, up my sleeve. So happy to help. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. And thank you to everybody who's joined us today. Uh, we hope that this was helpful to you and um, we're here for you if you ever want to reach out to us. Thank, thank you. you.